including the Chiniki, Bearsport, and Wesley First Nations. Uh, the city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, uh, Region 3. And today we're uh, very pleased and very fortunate to have with us Dr. Leonora Neville. Dr. Neville is the John and Jean Rowe Professor of Byzantine History at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She studies the culture and society of the Eastern Roman Empire, particularly history writing, gender, and the importance of the classical past for medieval Roman culture. Amongst her recent publications, she's offered a new interpretation of Com Anna Comnini's strategies for writing classicizing Greek history as a woman in Anna Comnini, The Life and, Life and Work of a Medieval Historian, uh, published with Oxford in 2016. And to help bring her field to uh, a broader study, uh, she wrote a guide to Byzantine historical writing, uh, published with uh, Cambridge. And she's also published an overview of her thinking on gender in Byzantine Gender uh, with Arc Humanities Press uh, 2019. Today, she's going to talk, uh, to speak to us on the topic of reconsidering Anna Comnini, authorship, gender, and authority in the 12th century uh, Constantinople. So uh, if I can ask that you uh, mute your microphones uh, during the talk, but do feel free to uh, use the chat function throughout. Um, we'll certainly address the chat questions and live questions at the end of the presentation. So welcome, Leonora. Thank you so much, Leslie. Thank you for the invitation and thank you also, Courtney. I'm delighted to be with you in some sense, if not in a physical sense. I hope at some point I do get to visit your university and get to meet you all in person and for real. Um, but meanwhile, it's just delightful uh, to get to see you and to share some research and um, hoping to get to know more of you as the afternoon progresses. Um, and I'd like to say hello to uh, Noreen and others that I have met before. Um, good to see you. Uh, today, I'm going to start by answering what I think is an important preliminary question, which is, why do I have a chair in Byzantine history when the Byzantine Empire never existed? Uh, so I want to start with why we have this fake civilization that we study um, and what I'd rather study instead, which I do, do think has impact on my main subject for today, which is the history of Anna Komnini and her strategies as an author. So I'm going to share my screen and give you some slides, um, which I will start from the beginning. All right, so it's my title. I'm going to be reconsidering Anna Komnini. Um, I have to get my keyboard somewhere where I can hit the advance button. All right, first, what is the Byzantine Empire and why? We're going to start where I'm sure you all know. Uh, which is the Roman Empire at its height. And you can see the eastern to western ends of the Mediterranean just fine. And then suddenly it gets beset by arrows, originating conveniently from underneath the legend on the map. And the arrows you will see whiz mostly over to the western Mediterranean. And you will note in this attack of arrows, representing, of course, barbarian invasions in the fourth and fifth centuries, most of them are in the west, and there are very few arrows which go over to the east. Right? After this era of invasions, our next map in a standard textbook would have the Western Roman Empire having changed into what are called barbarian kingdoms, circa 526. We have Ostrogoths and Franks and their beautiful di differently colored uh, kingdoms. Meanwhile, Slavic peoples, Avars and Slavs, float free in the sea of yellow, and the Roman Empire has become the Byzantine Empire on our map. Notice also the suspiciously straight division between east and west, a nice clear border that's over a mountain range. All right, so that, that should always um, spark a little bit of suspicion. Now this new map 
shows a Byzantine Empire where we used to have the Roman Empire, but of course, remember, there weren't any arrows there, which means that change never happened. This is a cartographic uh, representation of what in fact happened, which is that the Roman Empire stayed the Roman Empire in the Eastern Mediterranean. So there was no Byzantine Empire, it was the Roman Empire. And it had been the Roman Empire for around 500 years in the Eastern Mediterranean at the period when the arrows were coming, right? So by 500, they'd been Roman for about 550 years, and they'd been citizens of this empire for about 300 years. Just to give this some perspective, 300 years ago, it was 1720, right? 550 years ago today, it was 1470, right? So this change in which the people in the Eastern Mediterranean became Romans, right? They believed they were Romans, they said they were Romans, they called their language Roman, right? That's a long-standing thing. If you think about where the land that you stand looked like, 550 years ago in 1470. Um, it's not, not a strange thing to think that it's possible to believe this idea that the people in the Eastern Mediterranean were in fact Romans, speaking Roman, um, which they did, and their neighbors called them the Romans in different forms, clear up through the 20th century. Right. So given that that happened, and none of that is in dispute, what's wrong with reality? that we have to say it's a Byzantine Empire instead. Right? And here you have a wonderful picture of my daughter wearing her We Are Rome, Not Byzantium t-shirt, um, which I, I thank her for modeling that for me. Um, so the discipline of Byzantine studies addresses a culture and society so disturbing to Western European self-conception that its identity and existence had to be erased. So there never was a Byzantine Empire, and no people called the Byzantines ever existed. That's a 16th century term that was invented as a way of getting around a part of history that was extraordinarily inconvenient. I would like to spend a few minutes talking through some of the major arenas of work that this renaming does for the project of Western history. First off, Charlemagne wanted to be emperor. Charlemagne and others in the West were uh, interested in taking the patrimony of Rome for themselves, whether Charlemagne himself is all that interested. Um, within his culture and in succeeding years, there are plenty of people in the West who wanted the Roman heritage to be Western. And if antiquity isn't dead, you can't Renaissance it. So here, one of the major reasons why the Byzantine Empire needed to be created to occlude the, the reality um, was that uh, it's this desire to uphold Western Europeans' discovery of classical antiquity in the Renaissance that set them on the path towards intellectual superiority and domination, and eventually the colonization of the rest of the world. Right? So this is a narrative of a particularly European interaction with antiquity that led to particularly European greatness. That narrative doesn't work if you have a Homer quoting Aristotle reading civilization in the Eastern Mediterranean that's Roman and never lost it, which is in fact the case. Um, another major arena of work uh, done by the erasure of the Roman Empire is that it allows us to conceive of history as having distinct religious phases. An ancient world, uh, which was seen up until the 1990s as not really properly religious, right? It, it was imagined as a secular space, certainly in the Enlightenment, and that idea that the Romans didn't really believe all that stuff, all the temples notwithstanding, um, was a pretty strong idea, um, clear through most of the 20th century. So there's this not really religious antiquity, followed by a deeply reverent theological medieval world, right? So the Middle Ages was the age of faith, followed again by a recovery of rationality in the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. That trajectory from a, a lack of religion or an enlightened secularism imagined uh, to a deep religiosity in Christianity in starting in the fourth century, the middle medieval period, followed by a, a secular renaissance, that means you can't have a Roman Empire that's Christian, 
right? So when the Roman Empire became Christian in the fourth century, it had to turn into something else because the Roman Empire is necessarily a pagan state. We can talk about more of that in the Q&A if, if people who study religion are interested in that aspect of this. Another one I want to talk about, which I'm understanding more recently as I'm developing my thought on Byzantine gender, uh, is this discourse about the, the Byzantines right, as being um, effeminate, servile, oriental, superstitious, craven, duplicitous, decadent, luxuriant. It's a negative discourse about the horrors of Byzantine civilization. And I think this discourse is at its root about fear of misplaced gender. Right? It's fear of badly performed gender, and it constructs this alien Eastern civilization as everything that proper upstanding Western Europeans ought not to be. So I am coming to believe that this is, in a sense, a co colonial discourse. It's part of colonialism that you're creating this state um, as something that's a foil to the European upstanding rational masculinity um, by being in dialogue with this entirely invented state. Uh, and I want to give you just a taste of sort of a, a late 19th century understanding of the Byzantine Empire, which I think will clarify this point a little bit. This is from 1873. It's William Lakey's European History of Morals. And he has a description of Byzantine civilization that has just a good example of this very negative discourse about Byzantine civilization. Of that Byzantine empire, the universal verdict of history is that it constitutes with scarcely an exception, the most thoroughly base and despicable form that civilization has yet assumed. The Byzantine empire was preeminently the age of treachery. Its vices were the vices of men who had ceased to be brave without learning to be virtuous, without patriotism, without the fruition or desire of liberty, after the first paroxysms of religious agitation, without genius or intellectual activity. Slaves, willing slaves, in both their actions and their thoughts, immersed in sensuality and in the most frivolous pleasures. The people only emerge from their listlessness when some theological subtlety or some rivalry in the chariot races stimulated them into frantic riots. They exhibited all the externals of advanced civilization. They possessed knowledge. They had continually before them the noble literature of ancient Greece, instinct with the loftiest heroism. But that literature, which afterwards words did so much to revivify Europe, could fire the degenerate Greeks with no spark or semblance of nobility. The history of the empire is a monotonous story of the intrigues of priests, eunuchs, and women, of poisonings, of conspiracies, of uniform and gratitude, of perpetual fratricides." End quote. So that's really a bit much. Right? And I think we're justified in asking where this vim comes from. There's, there's more anger and horror and vitriol about this imagined empire uh, than makes sense if it's unmotivated. Right? So in digging into the motivations of this uh, is where I see this as part of an effort to really characterize what an upstanding Western European dominating society would be like. Um, and if you see so many of these critiques are fundamentally critiques about poorly performed gender. Um, so the, that they're effeminate, servile, oriental, superstitious, decadent, and uncreative and luxuriant um, are, are traits that have to do with um, not being upstanding men. So that their, their faith in crazy miracle stories and the excessive religiosity and magic or belief in demons uh, mark them as devoid of, of rationality so that they're not really masculine because they're, they're being womanish and they're superstition. 
um, the oriental despotism and their slavish servile behavior was a problem because they were docile and passive the way women were supposed to be rather than upstanding and dominant the way men were supposed to be. Um, the excessive luxury and sexual indulgence and softness uh, is a characteristic that, that points out that they don't have the strength and the power and the, the gung-ho-ness that you're supposed to have as a properly dominating man. Um, the complaint that Byzantine art is a constant repetition of ancient motifs, um, it's a way of saying that they did a lot of art, but it had no creativity in this way that valorizes creativity as masculine generative art, whereas just the repetition, it's decorative, it's like a craft. So women's art is just craft work, right? So all of the Byzantine efforts to sort of uh, um, interact their classicism was a feminized repetition of craft motif, right? Whereas the Renaissance men, they were really creative when they were classicizing things. Um, of course, it's the same process. Uh, right, and so then the power that's held by the priests, eunuchs, and women is just a gender inversion that seemingly left the European readers shuddering in disgust. Right? So the underlying problem that the Europeans projected onto the Byzantines was that they were not proper men. Um, so, and I, as I said, I do think this is really in a sense a colonizing discourse, but we can talk about that more later in the q and I just think it's important to bring up. And then the last arena in which this fake empire does work um, for modern people um, is that of Greek nationalism. So another reason why you want to deny the reality that this is a Roman Empire in the Middle Ages is because if they're Romans, well then they're not Greeks. And if you want to have continuous Greek continuity from the Parthenon till now, uh, then it does, it kind of puts a it's sticky if suddenly for over a thousand years they weren't Greeks, they were Romans. So that's why I say they called themselves Greek of Romans. You know, they, they thought they were Romans, they called themselves Romans. And this very common discourse, which you'll still hear at the Byzantine Studies Conference, people, scholars will still be saying, oh, of course, you know, they called themselves Romans, which of course implies that they weren't, right? Um, so, um, and it's, it's, you can see it's connected with old ideas about racial categories. Right, um, but if you have the idea that your ethnicity and your sense of self is constituted by the way your community imagines your community, then you can really be a Roman. So those are some of the reasons, right, why I think um, that this Byzantine empire sticks around because it's useful for a lot of different things. And you can see some of those Charlemagne, that's all the way back to the ninth century. Greek nationalism is a more of a, a modern issue. The issue of how we conceive of ancient religion, whether that's, and the change in religion, that's something that's of, of a lot of interest um, in, in scholarly circles now, the, the idea, um, but it's, it changes over time is what I'm trying to say. This, what Gibbon had in his um, re-envisioning of antiquity as a secular space was doing different work from what imagining the Romans is not really liking their work, their religion did for, for Henry Ward Fowler in the early 20th century. Um, so lots of different kinds of work. So the upshot basically is that the Eastern Roman Empire is really good to think with because it's profoundly unsettling. If you're going to acknowledge the reality that the Roman Empire as a classicizing Christian, Roman, Greek-speaking state uh, and society was real, that shatters a lot of categories. And it messes with a lot of the fundamental paradigms of our discipline, even though we don't really buy into them that much, right? So there are not that many people who are gonna be standing up for Western civilization with the same vehemence as people in the past did. Um, but yet it's still there in such a way as to make the Byzantine Empire disruptive. All right, so now on to Anna Komnini, gender and authorship and authority. I wanna talk about uh, gender and historical authorship in the 12th century, and then gender and authority and power in the 18th, 19th and 20th centuries and how those conceptions of gender were different, but also enough the same to cause problems for our author. 
And considering gender and authorship in the 12th century helps us understand Anna's history. Considering gender and authorship in the early modern and modern period helps us understand how we have misunderstood her history. So a background moment on Anna. Anna was born in 1083 and around the middle of the 12th century, she wrote a history of her father. Her father was the Emperor Alexis Komnenos, who ruled from 1081 to 1118. This is a long, big history. Here we go, here's a, here's a copy, so thick, right? Um, it's mostly, most pages are a perfectly normal classicizing history. You would recognize it as a narrative of the deeds of men in war and politics organized chronologically, told in a basically dispassionate way, but lots of rhetoric, tweaking things and making arguments. Um, it's recognizable as part of the Greek historiographic writing tradition. Except every once in a while, it gets really weird. Um, Anna will cry. She will express tremendous degrees of sadness. She will dote on her father. She will remind you much more often than you need to that she's the daughter of the emperor. Um, and in certain other ways, it's just, it, it steps out of normal patterns for history in ways that are kind of surprising and puts Anna as a major, not just not a character in the history, but her authorial presence is marked, right? Um, and Anna is also famous for a couple of things that didn't happen and that she didn't do. She's really famous for this moment of conspiracy in which her husband decided not to try to murder her brother to make her empress, right? That didn't happen. And then the other major event in her life, according to standard narratives, was that her brother, uh, John, did not then confiscate her property. Um, that's a little strange to be famous for stuff that didn't happen. Um, and I want to dig in a smidge more I want to walk you through what's a pretty, um, first let's go to Kavafi, right? Um, Kavafi, Alexandrian poet, wrote in, uh, writing in Greek, um, later in Q&A, if the classicists want to geek out with me looking at the Greek, it's a lot of fun um, because his language is, is, um, is his own. It's a, a formal, modern, classicizing Greek. Um, and when he thought about medieval history, he wrote, read the Alexiad um, and wrote this poem in which he characterizes her. In the prologue to her Alexiad, Anna Komnina laments her widowhood. Her soul is all vertigo, and I bathe my eyes, she tells us, in rivers of tears, alas for the waves of her life, alas for revolutions. Sorrow burns her to the bones and the marrow and the splitting of her soul. But the truth seems to be that this power-hungry woman knew only one sorrow that really mattered, even if she doesn't admit it. This arrogant Greek woman knew only one consuming pain, that with all of her dexterity, she never managed to gain the throne, virtually snatched out of her hands by the impudent John. Right. So it's wonderful as poetry. And note that He's intrigued by her expressions of sorrow. And these are quotes from, from her Alexiad and her prologue, right? But he calls her the, the arrogant Greek woman, the Graikia, right? Um, and he says that she's lying, right? He knows, even if she doesn't admit it, right? So what's not in her story is that there's this backstory of wanting power and not getting it, right? So, he in fact takes the pathos of her expressions of sorrow as true, right? The passion is there, the emotion is there. She's just lying about the cause, right? And we know, he knows that the cause is really this political situation, right? Um, a more standardized, modern scholarly one paragraph description of Anna's life. I'm going to read to you. Now, as I read this, I want you to keep in mind that she was born in 1083, okay? While still an infant. And I want you to think of, we have three major um, problems that I see with this uh, paragraph I'm about to read you. Two, I think you can see while I'm reading it, and the next one we'll get to when I give you my version instead, all right? But try to think if you can find some logical issues. All right. So while still an infant, 
Alexius had betrothed her to Constantine Thukas, co-emperor and son of Michael VII, the previous emperor. As a result, Anna always nurtured the hope that as the future wife of Constantine, she would succeed to the throne. However, the birth of her brother John Komnenos in 1087 shattered her plans, and she remained hostile to her brother throughout her entire life. When her father died in August 1118, she and her mother plotted against her brother with the aim of securing the throne for her husband. The latter refused any involvement and retained loyalty to the family. When the conspiracy was brought to light, she was forced, following the death of her husband in 1183, 38, to retire to a monastery that she had founded with her mother. There she lived the remainder of her days and composed her historical work. She was tonsured a nun before her death. All right, so logical problem number one. How old was she when her brother's birth shattered her plans? Right. When my daughter was four, she wanted to be a unicorn, right? and she got over it. Right? Um, yeah, the, the lifelong ambition instilled in her cradle, to me, just doesn't make any sense. Right. The other logical flaw is that she's consigned to her monastery as punishment for a conspiracy that happened 20 years earlier. Right. If she, the John were really worried about her as a conspirator, you'd think that he would have gotten her out of the way a little sooner than that. Right. So full disclosure up front, I don't believe this story and I don't think it makes any sense. Um, though it's still kind of the standard narrative. I would like to see it replaced with something like the following. Anna Komnenos, born in 1083, was one of the leading historians and intellectuals of the 12th century. Her monumental Alexiad is the only surviving narrative history written in Greek by a woman before the 20th century. In addition to historiography, she studied classical literature, philosophy, medicine, mathematics, and astronomy. She patronized intellectuals and commissioned commentaries on Aristotle. Anna and her husband may have assisted their mother, uh, Arina Dukiana, with the administration of the empire during her father's last years as his health declined. She had six children, three of whom died before reaching adulthood, and then she became a nun in the middle of the 12th century. Right. So if you think about that one, you can see that the third problem with the standard narrative is that this conspiracy story sucks all of the air out of her biography so that she cannot be seen as an intellectual. All of the time and all of the attention that she's given is taken up with whether or not she wanted to be empress, right? Um, and her whole life as an intellectual then is kind of an, an offhand, you know, she wrote a history, right? So where does the discrepancy between these two stories come from, right? Um, Part of the answer is that the bones of this narrative were established in the 1760s, right? Using a fraction of the sources that we have available now and with strategies of interpretation that we would never consider. So simply re-examining the evidence leads to a new story, right? But the old story has a power that goes far beyond the evidentiary basis, which I think we can see with this the, the delayed reaction to the revolt and her having her imprisonment but 20 years later, that shows that there's a deep desire to keep this crime and punishment story going, but in an acknowledgement through new evidence that it didn't happen then, right? So they just, oh yes, she was still thrown into her monastery's punishment just a couple of decades after the supposed misdeed. Right. So there's something driving this and I think what drives this sense of her primarily as a thwarted conspirator are uh, reactions to the personality she puts forth in the Alexia. And I want to give you just a few quotes from one of the, the main people who's written about her, one of the most commonly read biographies, which is an old one put together by Charles Deal in 1906, which gives you some sense of sort of the underlying thinking in the field about Anna. She was much too fully aware of what she was for high birth as well as her intellectual superiority, not to be a woman of great ambition, right? So she had to be ambitious because she knew she was smart. Right? And in the next quote, I want to read the whole thing, but she was proud of the purple, proud of this, proud of this, proud of this, proud of this, right? Um, her pride uh, 
personal, ancestral, and national was immeasurable. Right? So somehow they think she's just wildly arrogant. And then when Deal describes the failure of her supposed plot after her brother becomes emperor, her brother was emperor. For the proud princess, this was a terrible and unexpected blow. For many years, she had lived in hope of inheriting the empire. Now all her dreams had crumbled. The audacity of John and the hesitancy of Ranios had overturned at a single stroke the whole edifice of intricate schemes so cleverly constructed by Anna and Irini. All right, there were no schemes, right? But just any conspiracy within this Byzantine framework, it has to be a scheme. Because remember, the scheming women and the eunuchs is all the Byzantines did? Okay. Um, the daughter of the emperor was inconsolable and in her frustration, obliterating all other sentiments, kindled in her heart the fury of a Medea. Right. And Anna Kamina was only 36 years old, but her life was over. And in that line, you can also see why she's not famous as a writer, because she wrote when she was already dead, rhetorically speaking. Right? They've cast her whole life after the supposed failed coup as a time when she was, you know, her life was over. And that's when she was writing and studying Aristotle and commissioning texts and writing letters and studying astronomy, right? That was a fake dead time because her life is defined by this politics and this anger. All right. So let's dig into where does this sense of both her arrogance and her anger right, that terrible passionate fury of the Medea, where does that come from, right? And I see it fundamentally as arising from the discrepancy between 12th century ideas of gender and 18th through 20th century ideas of gender. And to start, where does it come from? Let's ask ourselves, so why is she the only woman to write a history in Greek before the 20th century, right? Why isn't this something the women did? And so let's think for a few minutes about the Greek historical tradition. It's an old tradition. Right? Anna would have said that it started with Homer and Herodotus and Thucydides. There's lots of variation in the tradition, but also a lot of stability. There are norms and tropes and patterns to Greek historical writing um, that sort of bound it in a set of rules, what Anna refers to as the laws of history. Right? Uh, and its subject was the deeds of men the things that they did in battle and the things that they said in politics. Plenty of other stuff was interesting, um, but the, that other stuff didn't happen to be what people wrote histories about. History was about boys in war, right? History writing required experience because the best way to know what happened in a battle or a situation or war was to have been there. And if you weren't at that particular battle, it helped if you had been in a different battle, you could understand the testimony of the witnesses that you interviewed to tell you about it. So the more experience you had in war and politics, the better qualified you were to be a historian. It also required research. Best, of course, if you were in those events yourself, but if you were not present, the historian ought to find people who were politically involved or who were at the battle and interview them talk to them and find documents and find texts that can help them understand what happened. Uh, you also needed to have education to write history. First, you needed to know enough about writing classical Greek that you could write in that language. Education also helped the historian be able to see through the rhetorical wiles of other characters, witnesses, and other texts. You needed to have that education to see how you're being led around by the rhetoric of your sources to know what was actually true and what really happened. History writing also required dispassion because you had to be able to put your own emotional engagement to the side uh, and look at the evidence and discern what was true, right? So, and a, 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 a lack of bias was considered really important and you could only have that since everyone loved their country, if you had the strength to control your emotions and leave your love of your place aside slightly as you're writing. Right. History writing was always self-aggrandizing because you're the one who's saying this is what happened and these people acted well and these people didn't act well and this was the cause of the problem. So you're putting yourself over the people that you're writing and casting judgment on them and it's a very aggrandizing thing to do. And by the, the 11th and 12th centuries, um, historians routinely would say things like in their introductions, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm not up for this. I know I'm not enough good writer. I don't have the skills to do this. 
but I have to do it to prevent the memory of these great deeds being forgotten but left into Lethe, right? So everyone commonly would decry their own abilities and make these humbling statements. And it was many humbling discourses were common in the 11th century in the 12th century um, because it was just obnoxious to say that you were so full of yourself that you thought that you're gonna be able to write a history and tell everybody what happened, right? And the last characteristic of classical history writing I wanna talk about is that it required the author to have a good moral character because at the end of your day, the only guarantee that you have that the author hasn't lied is that you trust his character, right? So the good moral standing of the historian is absolutely essential um, for a history to be trustworthy and to be believed, right? So now, let's think about those characteristics with regard to women who may have written in Greek, right? Um, so this is our tradition of historiography. Let's think about what was normal expected female behavior. Normatively, in the medieval Roman Empire, as in classical Greek, women were supposed to stay home. Elite women, particularly, were supposed to only go outside of the house for religious observances, and they weren't supposed to say anything in public ever. Um, some of Anna's near contemporaries were praised for never being heard to say anything. Her mother was never heard to speak. Um, and as with classical Athens, um, we're not really sure how much this actually worked in real life, um, but there was certainly the normative idea that you didn't leave the house, right? And so you were not interested in war and politics. Um, in that it required experience, well, women didn't have experience because they, they stayed at home. Their experience was with spindle and distaff. And they didn't talk to men, so they couldn't do research. And you certainly couldn't go ask a veteran what happened if you're not supposed to talk to anybody outside of your house. Um, and they had minimal education. Uh, women in Anna's era were certainly taught to read the Bible and get through saints' lives. They were not taught to read Thucydides uh, or Euripides. Anna was unusual in gaining those skills. As for dispassion, a fundamental tenet of medieval Roman conceptions of gender is that women were subject to passion. Women were under the control of their emotions. They were not able to control their emotions. And when women did control their emotions, they were said to be masculine, right? That was a manly characteristic. Women, uh, modesty was the most important characteristic for a woman to be a good woman in Anna's culture. Not only sexual modesty to keep, be, not wave her hands around and keep your hair tied back and, and avoid the gaze of men, uh, but fundamentally to be deferential to masculine authority. That demure deference is a key characteristic of women. So to do anything self-aggrandizing was really bad in Anna's culture. So. For a woman, good moral character was defined by modesty, seclusion, and devotion to family, right? So anything that a woman did in this column would make her a lousy woman, right? So, you know, it's no wonder that no one bothered to try to do this. Um, and so even if a Greek woman could get out of the house, talk to men about politics, interrogate witnesses, gain access to education, none of her readers would believe that she'd been able to do so. Uh, so what's the point? So for Anna to have any chance that her readers would believe she was capable of writing a history, she would need to prove to them that she had been able to gain personal experience in war and politics, interrogate witnesses, research the truth, gain the education to write about it, and had an unnaturally unfemale ability to control her passions and think dispassionately. History writing necessarily drew Anna into fundamentally transgressive behavior within her culture. She had to act like a man in order to write history. At the same time, she needed to have good moral character in order to get anyone to believe her history. Right? Um, so she could not let the transgressive nature of her activity undermine her moral standing as a good woman. So she had to be both a fully good morally exemplary woman as a woman, according to the standards of her culture, and participate in masculinizing activities and masculine discourses. So when you think about that as what she's up against, suddenly, remember all those things I said, it gets weird. All of the weirdnesses are places where she's trying to respond to the objections that arise from her project. And 
when you look at her text, she has a stopper for every single one of these problems. It's just that they're hard to see unless you understand the culture that she's working in. Um, so let me just go through some of her main rhetorical techniques and the effective response she's trying to get out of her audience. She stands up and says that she has the skills to do history, right? She tells everybody that she studied ancient philosophy. She's read Aristotle. She's read Plato. She cites Euripides in her first line. Um, and she says that she studied mathematics. And when she later on, that's all in her prologue. At other places, she says that she's studied astronomy. And she has a discussion of sources in which she said, yes, I interviewed old soldiers. I read dispatches from the front line. I had the documents. I talked to people. I interviewed people who were very old and were not interested in, in po current politics. Right? She stands up for her abilities as a historian. I believe that her intent is to ask her audience to trust her. She's trying to prove that she has the ability to write history. And of course, she's writing about her family. So within her own household, she can maintain her seclusion within the household and yet write about the emperor because it's her dad, right? Um, she also then makes many cases in which she's crying for our pity. She's like, I'm just an old widow. My husband has died. My parents have died. <laughs> she cries. Her lamentations um, are, are striking and strong. And what she's trying to do there is enact what Glenn Most has called the stranger's stratagem. It's a tale of woe. And the point and purpose of the tale of woe is to get your audience to feel sorry for you so that it humbles you. Right? If you're talking to an audience and you're saying, oh, here's this horrible thing. You're never going to believe what horrible woes I've suffered. Then your interlocutors are going to say, oh, that's too bad. And they'll sit and listen to you talk for a long time. Right? Um, so this is a, a standard humbling strategy for writers of her era that you talk about your woes as a way of getting people to feel sorry for you. Right? Um, and Every single time that she has a validating discourse that uh, stands up for her skills, right, something that substantiates her knowledge, that's a, her boasting, she always follows it with lamentations or one of these humbling discourses. So her description of how she interviewed old soldiers in her source description um, is spliced with lamentation and woe is me, woe is me. So it's absolute whiplash because you're talking about sources and texts, right? And then you're talking about the woes of her life. And then you're back to talking about her sources. And then you're talking about the horrible things that have happened to her, right? And it's a very confusing passage. But you realize that she can't say, I am a great historian for more than two sentences before she says, oh, but I'm a poor old widow. I'm so sad, right? Um, she works really hard at not being biased. Right? She wants to prove to everybody that she knows the laws of history require that she not be partial to her father. However, she must be a good daughter. She cannot undermine any sense that she's devoted to her father. So how does she write openly and fairly about her father? She says, I know the laws of history require me to say bad things about my father when he messed up. And I will tell you when he messed up, even though I'm also a devoted daughter. Right? Um, so she's trying to be both a good woman and a good historian. She does a lot of different techniques to try to get over this one. Um, one of my favorite is that <laughs> she'll tell us a bad story about Alexius and how he's screwing up, but he does it in a really heroic way, right? So for example, um, he goes off to fight Scythians in the northern part of the empire, and in order to have divine favor in the battle, he takes the veil of the Blessed Virgin Mary with him in a reliquary. Um, but then they lose the battle and he, this box is really heavy, so he, he hides it in the bushes while he runs away, right? Now, Anna is here being an unbiased, impartial historian because she lets us know that he went to battle, he lost the battle, and he hid the veil of the Blessed Virgin Mary in some bushes while he ran away. We would never know about this battle even existed if she hadn't told us. However, 
Alexius was the mighty, glorious Roman emperor who fought so hard he had um, 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 sweat that was like blood dripping off of him. And he worked so hard doing everything for his people. Um, and he was going to die there fighting if not his, his brothers and friends said, no, you must leave for the good of the Roman people. You have to flee. Like, All right, for the good of the Romans, I will flee. And then he fled so heroically that he bopped one skipping over the head and he put a spear in the next one. He saved his cousin's life by saying, oh, look behind you. Right? Um, and so heroically and nobly, he ran away. Another famous situation, Anna has him flee from a battle, but he flees on a horse that flew like it was, had a pegasus up and leapt in these incredible ways. Right? So over the top heroism, embroidering to honor a guy who's finally messing up, right? So she is showing us his dirty underwear. She is letting us know all of his problems, but she does it really nicely, just the way a good daughter would. Um, she also writes about um, history in such a way that for huge chunks, vast stretches, it's a narrative of deeds in war that looks just like any other narrative deeds of war, which means it's write it, written in a masculine voice, right? She adopts masculine historical discourse, uh, which is a way of being trustworthy. It fits the genre, it fits the rules. Um, and that, um, let's move over there. It's a way of, of her uh, saying that we should all just trust her history because she can do it. But and when, when we say normal history, I think that most of us don't consider that to be a masculine discourse. We kind of say, oh yeah, women didn't write history, but we don't really think of, for all those reasons that I laid out before, that the fact of writing history is writing like a man about man's stuff, right? So since she's writing in this masculine voice, every once in a while she wants to, to show that she is in fact a woman and a normal woman. So she'll switch, she'll turn it off and she'll have the emotional reaction that we would expect her, not we, but that her contemporaries would expect her to have as a woman. So for instance, her brother dies in the battle and she's writing a very dispassionate masculine narrative about the battle. And then she says, at this point, I must lament. And then, hi, hi, from the heights to the ground. And it's as if she has um, Meg Alexiou's book on, on ritual Greek lamentation on the shelf. So it's, it's a woman's discourse of ritual lamentation. And then she says, oh, but the laws of history pull me back and I must dry my eyes. And now I have it together. And as I was saying, then the battle, and then she proceeds with her discourse, which does a couple of things. It lets her, the audience know that she has the re emotional reaction that a woman is supposed to have at that moment, but she could also turn it on and turn it off. So she lets us see her cry and she lets us see her dry her eyes, get it together, and then say, now I'll return to historical discourse, right? And when she does this, her, um, the grammar of her gender changes, right? Her historical narrative voice is masculine plural. Now we shall look at this, now we shall look at that, um, and that but she's feminine singular when she's doing her female lamentation. And then she'll switch back and be back to masculine plural for the history stuff. Um, so she's, being a good and normal woman who just happens to have the strength of character to be able to control her emotions. All right. Um, so Anna didn't gloss over, uh, let me just catch up with my notes. I've gotten, yeah. All right. I think she could have glossed over the tensions. Right, she's a good enough writer. She could have sort of swept it under the rug, this issue of being impartial um, and yet um, being a good daughter or some of these other tensions. But rather, she lets us see her weaving them together, right? She could have easily written under a pseudonym. She could have said, oh, I just found my husband's history um, and, and got it not her, her vision, uh, which would have been infinitely easy for her. If she had decided to write under a pseudonym as a, as a male author, we would never, ever, ever, ever know, right? But instead she said, I'm gonna to try to write a history as a woman and weave these things together. And I think for some of her contemporaries or near contemporaries, her efforts didn't work. 
Some of them thought that she was transgressive and yucky and arrogant. Um, but there seems to be reason to think that some of them thought she was a good author and this was an interesting history and that her, her poetry and commentaries and letters were good and that she was a great intellectual. Um, so it certainly, it would have made sense to her contemporaries. They would have understood her tale of woe is like, oh yeah, that's the stranger stratagem. That's how you do it. Um, many of these discourses are not mysterious once you understand the gender rhetorical culture of her time. Um, but they're certainly mysterious to us. So whether or not it worked for those people, it didn't work for the 18th through 20th century readers. And in fact, an awful lot of the stuff really backfired. It worse than didn't work. It worked in the wrong way. <laughs> Let's just take another minute back to Charles Deal for just a second. We must not forget that she was a woman and consequently had a liking for the decorative for exterior magnificence, which sometimes concealed from her the true heart of things, that she was a passionate woman consumed by hatreds and resentments, and lastly, a learned woman, a literary stylist in love with fine phrases. All this, though it may diminish the strictly historical value of Anna Komnini's work, does not by any means make it less interesting. So early part of the last century, that she was a woman author is still a big problem, right? It still does diminish her, her work. Um, and some of it is the same. His idea that as a passionate woman that would get in the way of her history, that's the same assumption as in the 12th century that women would be passionate and hence not in control of their writing. Um, but he takes her love of fine phrases as a decorative feminine characteristic, whereas in her culture, the use of fine phrases was an aspect of masculine rhetoric. Right. So fundamentally, there's still problems with female authorship. They're just slightly different. It's a little bit orthogonal to the to the, the culture that she was aiming at. Um, and so we've misunderstood or had different understandings of what she was aiming at. It didn't have the effective response. The effective response we have is not the effective response she was aiming for. So when she made her case that she can do history and we ought to trust her, the actual response to her book in the modern era has been, she's so vain. Boy, is she full of herself. She's always talking about how the emperor is her daddy, right? Um, she's completely full of herself and proud. Remember that proud, 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 arrogant princess, right? Her claim that she's a pitiable old widow does not make us feel sorry for her. Rather, we think what's wrong with her? She's unhinged. What happened? And that what happened, something must have caused her to be so crazily angry um, drives the interest in her revolt, right? And that her, the story of Alexius bravely, bravely running away, that does not make her look impartial. It makes her look like she's so in love with her daddy and it's completely forgotten that we never would know about the battle and his loss, which he hadn't told us, right? So what she's really saying about him is discounted because we see very clearly all of this effusive praise for her father, right? Um, and that she can write history and writes with a masculine voice. We don't see it as a masculine voice, right? But rather, we just see her as, as a mannish woman who must have wanted power. Um, let's see, I've got the, um, in the middle of the 19th century, right, um, someone, Henrik uh, Krauss wrote of her history, right? We know that she had a more masculine than feminine character as she asserts by her very decision to make herself a history writer, right? So that she was engaged in writing history and is itself seen as part of making her mannish, right? So she was perceived as mannish, but that's not making her us think that she's a really good historian, but rather that she really wanted power. The other upshot for her masculine discourse has been rather recent. In 1996, James Howard Johnston made a really serious academic case that her husband wrote all the battle scenes and all the military parts because it's battles and women aren't interested in battles. And since she's a woman, she did the framing. She did all of the, the um, her lamentation discourse was by Anna, but when she's writing in that masculine voice, it was written by her husband and she just edited his notes, right? Um, because it's a masculine voice, right? And as for the normal female emotions, when she busts out crying now and again, it's not seen as a humbling discourse and it's not seen as making her a normal woman. It makes her seem like she's hysterical and unhinged. <laughs> 
right? So as with the Kvafis, remember, he believed that the passion was true. She was just lying about what she said she was upset about, right? So I also think that she's lying, that she's not really weeping about the death of her husband of old age 30 years ago. Um, but she's making that a, a case in order to provoke a feeling from us, right? Um, but rather, the modern readings hold that um, she's lying about the cause of her emotion, but the emotion is taken as, as absolutely true. And in a sense, it's a continuation of this idea that she must be just spewing emotion hopelessly and helplessly, right? She's writing this stuff out. Why? Because she can't help it. She's just so overwhelmed with anger that she has to spew that on the page. She's just going to say that it's sorrow instead of anger because she doesn't want to let us know that she's so angry about not having had the chance to murder her brother to become empress. Right. Um, all right. So we misunderstand her self-portrait. Um, so we then think she's got to be crazy. What's making her so angry? We know, we think, like her, she's lamenting um, the death of her father. Um, I forgot to say also that in her lamentation, she she bookends her history in the beginning of her prologue and in her ending, she's lamenting for the death of her father tremendously, which frames the whole history in a funeral discourse in which it's appropriate for women to talk, right? The only time a woman can talk in public is if she's crying at a funeral, right? So that funerary framing, the beginning and end, rhetorically sets this entire 500 long page history within a funeral lament, right? I just should have mentioned that. Um, but modern readers not knowing that think she's simply unhinged, right? And then we, we attribute her, her emotion, which is taken as real um, rather than as rhetorically a matter of self-construction um, and say it's because she's angry because she couldn't get to be empress, right? And then we use that to read the text. Right? So there are a number of, of passages in her history that are translated in which the difficulty of the Greek is resolved with reference to what we know about her history, which is that she desperately wanted to take over um, and seize power for herself. Right? Um, and then that story of the revolt explains the Alexiad. So we read the Alexiad with the knowledge of the revolt, and then it all makes sense. Right, and it, and it swings around. So one of the passages that's the linchpin for the idea that she led a revolt is it precisely in her description of her sources, where I said it was spliced together between talking about how she got her information by interviewing veterans and her talking about how she's a poor widow who had a horrible life and if you should feel sorry for her. And she makes a claim for isolation that you know, we, we have all been um, occluded and in isolation for 30 years. That sentence happens right after she said, I've gone and interviewed old soldiers, right? So she's doing the big nasty thing she's not supposed to do as a woman, which is to get out of her house and talk to men who's not related to her, right? Um, and then she immediately makes this claim for isolation. That claim for isolation is taken out of that um, situation and used as the proof that she's been in the non-monastery her whole life. Right? The whole idea that she was confined to that monastery comes from that one sentence in which she claims isolation. Um, and I see the claim of isolation as motivated by the rhetorical necessity of saying that she's a good person and that she's nice and she's playing by the rules, even though she just told you she doesn't because she doesn't interviews old veterans to get her stories, right? So, but the, the, the interpretation of the revolt comes from this misunderstanding of her rhetoric and around and around and around that goes. Um, I could geek out quite a bit about the politics of this and more reasons why I think, um, this the revolt story didn't actually happen. I think it it very largely falls apart when you don't need it to explain why she seems to be emotional in this text. Um, but that that deals with a lot of 12th century names that I don't think it's a particular interest that so we can certainly deal with it in the Q and A. I do want so basically. We perceive her as being the power hungry, arrogant Greca. Um, and then the historical narrative that supports that has become accepted, right? So we buy 
the narrative of history that fits with the reading we have of her emotionalism in the text. I also want to end by saying that we like that story. We need to reflect about our own culture. I opened up by talking about all the work that the, the Byzantine Empire does for Western civilization, right? And why people for hundreds of years have preferred that to looking at what actually happened. Right? And we, we still like Sarah Bernhardt's Theodora, right? And the Sardu um, play, right? People like reading and watching Cersei Lannister. Right? There's something about you know, the, the power hungry woman who is taking control. Um, there's the books of the um, uppity women from the Middle Ages. I don't have it. I should have gotten up on a bookshelf. But um, so yes, someone in, in a, in, that I know for the community setting said, oh, you do history. You should, you'd love my copy of uppity women from the Middle Ages. It's got a chapter on Anna Komnini, right? And like, yes, I know that chapter. And it's like, yeah, she wanted to murder her brother and become empress, woohoo. Um, rather than, you know, she actually did something even much more astonishing in writing her history. Um, so, for our, our ideas about the proper behavior of men or women um, are part of why the story is preferred to the one that I like, which is about um, Anna as an intellectual, right? Um, and that puts the focus on her skill as a writer. So that's, um, you know, uh, that has to do with us rather than Anna. Um, and I think, you know, one of the, the main reasons why Anna is not better known in comparison to other women intellectuals in the Middle Ages who did much less um, is because of the dominance of this story, this lurid story of um, failed conspiracy. Um, so I would like to change that traditional narrative about her, not just because it's wrong historically, but I think it's just bad. So thank you for your attention and I'd be very happy to take questions. And let me blip out of my screen. Well, I'd just like to thank you for an absolutely wonderful um, and, and fascinating talk. Thank you. Uh, I'm sure we must have some questions. Maybe we can take some questions uh, from the uh, floor first. If anyone wants to unmute themselves and ask a question. Oh. I saw a bunch of hands up. Mm. Um, I have to find out how to open. Okay. Should we should we go by hands or who? John, I can oh. see you have a question. Do you want to unmute yourself? You're still not unmuted. There we uh, go. Is, is that all right now? Yes. Um, just, just two very, very simple questions. The first one was related to the, the huge history of the decline and fall by Edward Gibbon. Mm -hmm. Was he aware of her as an author other than simply an historical figure? And the second part of the question is, had she written instead in pre-Christian times, a thousand, let's say 1,200 years earlier, in the Greek society of the time, would it have been easier for her without having to adopt all the characteristics which you describe? All right, interesting. Uh, Gibbon did know her as a historian. He used the Alexiad. Mm -hmm. um, he says that it betrays on every page the vanity of a female author. Yes. Um, and he's, he's very harsh on Anna. However, he uses her interpretation of the First Crusade completely. So he, he cribs his entire uh, understanding of these, uh, these religion crazed Westerners who attack the East for no good reason. Um, so he read the Alexiad very closely. That's her argument. Um, but he just thought she, he also had the sense of her as arrogant and, and awful. Her history is used throughout the early modern period. Um, so it's, she's, she's quite commonly read because she's one of the best sources for the First Crusade and also for the Turks. Um, so before it was, it was published um, in the 1640s, it circulated in different chunks. There was the chunk about the Crusades and there was a chunk about the Turks that circulated pretty widely in a lot of manuscripts. And there weren't very many manuscripts of the whole thing. That's, a, that's an aside. Um, 
And then I think that very few of these impediments to her writing actually have to do with religion, right? If we think about uh, women should stay home and tend to children and weave, right? The spindle and diff staff is the same. The, you oughtn't hear about women in public unless it's a funeral oration. That was the same. Um, when she's looking for models of how she can speak with a female voice, um, she gets them from Gregory of Nazianzus writing in the voice of Mary lamenting Jesus upon the cross, right? Their lamentations, what Eve said when she was cast out of Eden. Right? Um, but those are themselves very modeled very much on ancient Greek lamentation. It's, it's Hecuba, it's, it's Iliad, it's, um, um, it's Euripides, right? It's you know, the Trojan women. Um, so her models for, for women speaking in a valorized way are all women speaking in lamentation and they're very classical. Um, so I don't see the religion as playing much of any role in this. I think the humility might be more pronounced in the 11th and 12th centuries, the need for authorial humility among the male rhetoricians. Uh, we don't have very many female rhetoricians. Um, but the stranger stratagem that I was talking about, the tale of woe, that's a classical thing. Um, I mean, second sophistic, classical to me. I don't know. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you for the question. Uh, Carolyn? I think you had your hand up. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that talk. It was wonderful. I have a question. Um, uh, so you say Anna discusses interviewing eyewitnesses. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to know how common was it for 12th century Eastern Roman historians to indicate that their sources were based on interviews. Mm -hmm. And the reason I ask this is that because in the medieval Latin West, as you know, women normally didn't write history, but they were the ones who were the keepers of the family memory. Mm -hmm. And they would be interviewed by the male chronicler or relative. And mm -hmm. I, I, I've learned this through, uh, you probably, Elizabeth Van Hoot's book on memory and gender that yeah. she looks at in ninth to 12th century mm -hmm. England and France really. I was wondering if there, if, if maybe Anne is sensitive to interviews as a woman, thinking that they're a good source of uh, good source. Because I don't see any evidence of that tradition of women as memory keepers in her society. Like I just, I think I think that's a different thing. These cultures they're contemporary, but they're really pretty different. Um, and so connections between women and memory. You know, um, or interviewing a woman, women aren't supposed to talk in a pretty profound way. Um, they're supposed to pray. Um, but you're not supposed to hear when they're praying either. I'm happy you said that. <laughs> um, I think it's um, her contemporaries do talk about, um, they talk about having been there they talk less about their means of getting sources than she does. And I think she talks about it because she's so finely, oh, acutely aware of the, the tradition being stacked against her. Um, they were reading the, the older histories, the classical histories a lot. And so, you know, if you, it's as if she had John Marincola's book on the Greek historiographical tradition on her shelf. I mean, it really, it does read as if she knows she's intimately aware of that tradition. Um, the, the male politicians at the time, I think it's fair to say that a lot of them wrote memoirs or histories and we have more texts that we can see like part of the history will be written one person's perspective and then another part will be written in somebody else's perspective that makes you think they're knitting together sort of memoirs, right? Or, or histories, personal histories. Um, and she, when the way she describes some of these texts, it makes you think that she's reading texts that were written by individuals describing what happened in a certain event. Um, so I would say in her era, people are most interested in um, that personal autopsy, right? I'm writing this history on the basis of stuff that I know. Um, but she's just clear that she's writing it on the basis of what she knows from herself. And she does, in that description of her sources, she admits to having gotten out of the palace. She says, I actually went on campaign with my dad. 
um, but she's very embarrassed about that. And, it, and again, it's that immediately, but I, you know, no one can believe the things I've suffered yeah. as if that's logically connected. I hope that helps. So in terms of um, passing on questions from the chat, we have had a couple. Um, did you want me to dictate or did, did you want to read them? Let me see if I can find the chat just a second. <laughs> If you just go to the bottom of the screen on the more button, there should be an option for the chat. Okay. Um, so should we read from? We have a question from, from Cassandra. Mm -hmm. uh, removal of modern day gender and history bias in your work. How do you begin to restudy anachronies through this new interpretation? Um, yeah, so where do we go from here? I think um, that's that's interesting to think about. I think that we're just seeing the text new for the first time, you know, and I think it's pretty stunning if you think about people have been reading this thing for over a thousand years um, and well, like 800 years, okay. Um, and we've really not understood it very well. Um, so and it's as you understand one aspect of the rhetorical culture, um, then more things fall into place. So even just that, that your question isn't what's wrong with her, but why is she saying this and what does she want us to feel? Um, that's a new question. And I think you should ask that of every piece of writing that comes out of this era in this culture, because when they were learning to write, they read handbooks that said, no, if you want your author audience to feel this way, you can make, make this case, right? Uh, well, you know, Demosthenes says, and this makes you feel this, right? Um, so I think that's the right question. And if we ask that question of the text, then we just start reading them in really different ways. Um, I think the next step just going through my this again, um, someone has to write a book doing much the same thing with Nikitas Koniatis, who's a later historian who just um, hates everyone in Anna's family, apparently, but the work that that's doing is deflecting blame across away from himself. He was one of the people who was in charge of the decline of the empire before it got sacked by the crusaders, right? So, and he's writing a history in which he's, He's basically trying to say that everyone was to blame for this except him. Um, and part of that is, is to create an origin story that the, the roots of our current problems lie in the, in the sexual dysfunction within this family. And he creates everyone in, in a, a horrifying caricature of gender inversion, right? We're blind to all of those except Anna, who we single out because that fits into a pattern and people know like, oh, power hungry woman. We see that and that everybody else has also inverted her family, we don't see. So we see like one quarter of this invective and make a big deal about it. So we, we can go through and reread his story and his whole history asking the question, what did he want us to feel when we read this and understand enough of his culture that we can guess at that. Um, then we can really start understanding what their texts are saying. Um, and for the, the other part of how do we remove our own biases, we have to look it in the eye. So many people would say it's not a big deal to talk about the Byzantines and that, you know, Leonor has kind of got, you know, she's got her thing about wanting to talk about the Romans rather than the Byzantines, but really it's fine to talk about the Byzantines. Um, that's sort of occluding that whole preamble I gave of the work that this name does for us um, and sort of assumes that it's all fine. But if you look at it and say, well, this is all these complaints about this horrid, horrible civilization are in fact complaints about gender. And that does mean it's actually playing a role in a colonizing sense of how for building up European domination over the rest of the world. Um, this just gets caught up in that and helps define Europe. If we really think through that and the implications of that, then we can become aware of where we stand. And even this idea that there's still the desire to have Anna be a great uppity woman, you know, well, what is that really saying about us in our society, right? So self-interrogation, I think, will help us come clean. Um, and then um, we, I think the, the number of people in the field who want her to be a woman who, who wanted power, they just want that story to be true, um, is a lot. And they will interpret all sorts of things um, in that line to hold up that story. And it's kind of like, what is it about us that wants that so much? I hope that's helpful.
Um, as Courtney pointed out, we have a follow-up question to that as well from Wendy, and then I believe uh, Erica posted the next question. Wendy. Um, yeah. Right. Yes, Wujitan. Influence on other women. Um, Did you want to unmute yourself, Wendy, and just ask your question? Yeah. Go ahead, Wendy. Sorry, sorry. I've just it's just taking me a minute. Sorry, I'm in my <laughs> pajamas. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I just um, you know I I guess the context for the question is I work on material of uh, medieval Chinese women and mm -hmm. Empress Wu Zetian. The, the comparison with em Empress Wu Zetian comes to mind because she um, actually did kill people and take power. <laughs> and um, But she's an anomaly and yeah. she got attacked by male historians as soon as, you know, her tomb was cold. Mm -hmm. um, but there is some, so we're, you know, in, in our field, we're always trying to recover mm -hmm. uh, other kinds of that women may have had in the seventh and eighth centuries in in China um, because she is an anomaly yeah um, and I'm I'm just wondering if there's so so there's ways of actually seeing that during the time she was reigning there was an explosion of um, creation of mo of um, memorials and monuments by women mm -hmm. uh, as a collective Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if there's any kind of I don't I don't know I mean yeah. it's a fascinating area and I know artistically very rich but I, I wonder if there's any kind of other material that would give us a sense of whether or not Anna or other you mm -hmm. know elite women um, active in this period may have influenced the cultural scene. Yeah, I mean, we we don't have the, the information that we would like. Um, mm. If she didn't think people would take this seriously, read her work as a woman, if she didn't think it was possible, she just would have written pseudonymously, right? She had the mm -hmm. option to say, you know, she found her husband's history. So I think she, she did trust that it was worthwhile to do it. Um, there were other contemporary women who had, you know, literally used the word salon, but, you know, they paid people to do literature with them. Um, so she wasn't alone in that. There was women's patronage of monasteries, women's patronage of manuscripts and poetry and things. Um, so uh, she wasn't the only woman to get this kind of education. Um, and the, the, the male intellectuals talk quite a bit about the women who are paying them to do their work. Um, it was, the, the creative act was so, um, transgressive, well, women weren't supposed to be doing the actual creation themselves, right? Writing, and this, we're understanding more that the act of writing itself was seen as really arrogant, right? So there's this play between, uh, of humility, these tropes of humility are really big among them, as well as these tropes of boasting, because they're competing for the commissions, right? So there's this, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm the best poet out here, but I'm so humble, I'm so humble, I'm so humble, you know, that <laughs> they all have that back and forth. Um, mm -hmm. So none of her letters survive, but apparently she wrote many, many letters. She had a lot of other writing that we don't have. And we have this mm -hmm. history because people want to know about the Crusades, they want to know about the Turks. Um, and it's a really good history. So there are external reasons why this particular text was saved. And her framing, her beginning and her end, um, survive in very few copies. It's a miracle that we have them. Her prologue mm -hmm. uh, survives in a manuscript that's examples of really good prose. It's a rhetorical manual, right? Mm -hmm. And we only have a very fragmentary, um, she, she uh, says at one point when her father is dying, now I must turn and end the history and begin the, the, the tragedy. Um, and there's this pen drop across the ages as all the manuscripts end, right? <laughs> Except for one that goes on and preserves her last 10 pages. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's close to there, we don't have the ending. Uh, so, so I think that's why her history survives. There are very modest women who are patronizing churches collectively uh, women and men. Well, so there's tiny little churches which have 
lists of 20 or so women who helped pay, mm -hmm. pay for it. Um, so there is that kind of stuff. So I, I think there is other work. Um, to go back to, to Empress uh, Wu, she's exact contemporary with Emperor Irini, um, from, who was around, died in 803, who um, came to power with the help of religious change. For her, it was um, overturning iconobasm, but as, as Empress Wu had help of the, the Buddhists, right, and eunuchs. Mm -hmm. So there are striking similarities at the surface level of both how they got into power and how they maintained power. And I've often thought, mm -hmm. wouldn't it be fabulous to know somebody who was interested in gender and studying medieval Chinese history in the seventh century so that we can do a comparison you know, there we go. Um, because the parallels nice. in the way these two women held and maintained power in these very patriarchal societies um, are, are really striking. Um, so perhaps we should yeah. talk. You know. Indeed. Well, I, I would love to talk. And Empress Wu also had a female prime minister. Oh. Which is really interesting. All right. They didn't have that, but. <laughs> Pretty cool. <laughs> but yeah, I'd love to talk. Thank you so much for a great talk. It was fascinating. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, and now Erica asks, um, Erica, did you want to repeat your question or I can dictate as well? Not seeing anything. Does the power hungry woman strictly come from more modern interpretations of her writing or are there sources contemporary that imply the same conclusion? Um, Agrippina the Younger come to mind. Um, the, the history I mentioned, Nikitas Koniatis, the guy who does the gender invective of everybody, um, he was writing, he revised his history after the sack of Constantinople in 1204, but he was writing uh, in the, the 1190s or so. So um, this part of the story is actually from the 11, 1180s, 1190s chunk. Um, so that's quite a bit after the events, right? Like 80 years after um, the coup. And he says that um, Varenius um, didn't want the power, her husband didn't want the power, but she did. And her, her mother didn't hate, there's a, the mother hated the son. So part of the objective is that the mother, instead of loving her son, hated the son and didn't want him to have power. And then the husband uh, was sort of bullied by the wife. Um, and so he, he snapped at her and yelled at her once in a while, but basically he was being bullied by her. Um, and then Anna really wanted to be a man and got really upset. Um, so um, there's a scene in which he quotes her saying that, you know, nature had messed up and given them the wrong genitals, right? Um, and that line, just every single person who writes about Anna starting in 1760 quotes that sentence as something she really said. Um, and it's really fun to see how they deal with it because very few of them are actually willing to talk about the, the sexual vocabulary. So they read it, but don't read it. And it's, it's just a scream. Um, so for him, and that's where people say, oh, it's proved. And you know, the, uh, the reactions to my book are just like, oh, Neville makes some good points, but she forgets that Connie Octis lets us know, you know, and it's like, I don't believe him, right? I just, I don't see any reason. Um, his wife is, is, comes down in history as one of these women who never left the house and never said anything. Um, and he is relentless in his distaste for women in power. And remember I said he's trying to blame everybody for the fall of the empire except himself. He goes after the imperial women continuously saying as though it's these women running things uh, and it's one after the other. Um, so extremely misogynistic author trying to pin the blame for all the ills of society and the idea that women would ever leave the house or do anything or say anything. Um, so yes, he is the voice who's saying that she um, you know, she was this arrogant woman. Um, he doesn't say that she's arrogant. He actually doesn't say that. He just says that she had a hot burning desire for power. Um, <laughs> the, um, the entire, the, his story of the moment in which her husband tried to get his energy up to murder his brother-in-law and then wimped out, it's a one huge sentence that's an extended metaphor for failed male orgasm. Uh, it's just, it's, the whole text is wildly sexual. Um, but when you translate it to English, you can't get both levels, right? And when you see these authors are trying, the, the modern authors, early modern, are trying to get the facts, 
They want the facts and they're not interested in the fact that this, the whole thing is this wildly sexualized vocabulary. Um, so yeah, um, there's certainly, there's other texts that are closer to her that indicate that there is nervousness about the succession, right? So it's not as if there was nothing that anyone was worried about, but the way I read the actual politics was that Alexius, who reigned for a very long time and became an old sick man, didn't trust his son with an army and the power because he didn't want his son to take over, right? So he trusted, he put a lot of power on his son-in-law and his husband, um, and, and kept his own son out of power. And so there are these rumors about, you know, is John actually gonna succeed? And like, well, everybody says they want John to succeed and everyone has sworn loyalty to the heir. Um, and then he takes over. So the story that's in the Alexiad and other contemporary histories is that as Alexius was dying, John goes to the palace and gets himself crowned. Right. Um, so the scandal that's recorded in the histories that are closer to Anna's time is that John, the heir, left his dying father to seize power. Right. Um, and then it's only 60 years after that, that the reason he left his dying father to seize power is that his evil sister was going to take have a coup. Um, so what actually happened, we don't know. And I'm certainly not going to say that Anna didn't want to be empress. Because I think, like, who wouldn't want to be empress? Um, the, the idea that she had no no political ambition whatsoever is not something I'm going to try to argue. Um, but this is a story that we like for reasons that have to do with us and not them. Um, culture. I hope that answers that one. Um, but a lot of the the, the trope of the, the Agrippina the Younger, the, that's the same stuff, right? They get in it through, through Plutarch, but the, um, you know, you can be a good woman like Cornelia or you could be a bad woman like, you know, the others. It's, the options are rather limited, you know. Um, so. I'm trying to, is a, I'm trying to read Sydney's question. Um, colonial obsession with strict gender. All right, so do you think Anna can be both masculine and feminine at once? Do you think this extends to speak of the complexities of gender in Eastern Roman society? Yes. I think that in my interpretation of Eastern Roman gender, um, they believed that there were certain things that were innate in physical bodies, um, in masculine and male and female bodies, um, but that masculine and feminine behavior was a matter of ethical deportment and that you could be either more or less masculine or feminine. And men could be feminine and women could be mas masculine. And they talk about that all the time. So they see gender as performative. They see gender as inextricably linked to ethical behavior. So to be a good woman, you had to be a good woman, good as a woman, and to be a good man, you had to be good as a man. But their texts are constantly filled with women who are masculine, right, and men who are feminine. And they're obsessed with correct gender performance, right? And for women, when it came to having, since, masculine characters are always valorized. They were also valorized when they were like men, right? So the word for brave is the same as the word for, for manly, right? Um, and to have self-control, which you would need to be, to be properly modest, for, like, so for a woman to have proper deportment, which is not to incite like the sexual interest of men, she needs to have self-control to make sure that she doesn't wave her hands around, right? You, know, you keep your eyes down and your hair bound up and neat. Um, and keep your proper deportment, you'd need to have self-control. So women were supposed to try to have self-control. It was just expected that they didn't, right? So through their nature, women are subject to passion. But through a lot of hard work, they can too learn how to exercise control over their passions, right? And men who naturally have the ability to control their passions also can mess up and they can be feminine too if they don't exercise their self-control. Right. So it, it has a lot to do with, with control and power over self um, and modesty is wrapped up in, in covering uh, because it's a matter of, of helping everybody out to maintain their proper roles. Um, but th this culture is is very worried about um, 
performing gender in the right way. And so there are many, many cases in which people are crossing over and not doing it quite right. You know, and in some of the histories, some of the more perfunctory um, histories of less rich detail and characterization, you'll have things like, oh, you know, the, the army behaved like men and won, and then the army behaved like women and lost, and then they behaved like men and won, you know, so the same group of guys will be switching their genders rhetorically back and forth all the time because it's a way of ethically commenting on how they're acting. Um, so yeah, my masculinity and femininity are, are hardly fixed. Um, Let's see. All right, so has the understanding of her writing strategies changed perspectives and passages she reports in the Alexiad? Um, I don't think that work has happened yet. Um, the major change is in the change of the history of happened after Alexius has died. Um, and I think, you know, as I was saying earlier, we need to go back and reread Coniatis. Um, if we can read all of the narrative histories of this era with an attention to their gender, following on what I just said about the histories are obsessed with people performing their gender correctly, um, and the authors of histories are very concerned with the emotional response and the ethical response of the audience. You read history to learn how to behave, right? They all knew their Plutarch, like a lot. Um, and so the point of reading history is to get your lessons about how you should be as a person. Uh, so they're filled with political messages. So these texts which have been taken as sort of transcripts of events need to be reread as um, as display for what they tell us about the, the, the politics that's implied and the messages you're supposed to take away. They all have a, a political message that you're supposed to leave with about how you're supposed to behave. Um, and and so if we read that with gender, I think I think we've done we've gotten people have been really interested in Anna and the Crusades. Um, so it's been understood for quite a while that. She's commenting on the first crusade in a way that's supposed to have an anti-Latin stance towards the second and third crusades, right? She's speaking to the middle of the 12th century and trying to get people of that era. Uh, she has a politics that we shouldn't have confessionally based alliances, we should have politically based alliances. So, you know, um, hundreds of years it was, you know, whosoever's in Constantinople allies with whosoever in Cairo against whosoever in Baghdad, right? And that worked out fine for centuries. And then these Westerners come along and say, well, that doesn't make sense. It should be all the Christians against all the Muslims. Um, and so that's a, a major political um, controversy in 12th century Constantinople. Um, should we have all Christians against all Muslims or should we continue to be allied with whosoever convenient for us? Um, and she was on the latter side. She was saying that we should not be have our alliances based on religion, but based on politics. Um, but that's kind of been known for a while. Uh, so more soon, I suppose. I'll just read out a, a question from Scott here. Uh, Scott asks, how has the publication of various translations affected your approach to understanding the language used by Anna in your own analysis and how you translate the text? Um, well, the, it's, it's a long enough book that I'd be absolutely sunk without an English translation. Um, so I do, I read it in English when I was an undergraduate. I read it in English, you know, a couple of different times. Um, all those translations are pretty different from the, the Greek. Um, so when all the passages where she's doing, um, stepping outside of sort of the normal masculine discourse to write about herself, um, those are the, the sections in which the, it's really important to look at the Greek. I found um, Dieter Reinsch, who edited the text, did a translation to the German that is much more um, literal, right? So I would often get the Reinsch off the shelf and read, what did you say in German? To help me figure out what it is in Greek. Um, when it, it got to the sentence where she says that she's been in isolation for 30 years, that's in the middle of this very confusing passage on her sources, I actually showed that sentence to about a dozen classicists and said, what do you think this means? Um, and they all had totally different answers. I was trying to find people who wouldn't recognize it and say, oh yeah, this is where Anna says she's thrown into the monastery because it does not say that, right? Um, and then that one's really weird because she, she says that it, that's in her, um, it's in the masculine plural, 
right? So she's been using her feminine singular voice to talk about her tragedies and to talk about herself as a writer. And then she switches back. So it's her and a bunch of guys have had this experience and it's really kind of opaque. I still don't think I totally understand it. I'm not sure it's, I think that might be a textual problem, um, but it, it certainly doesn't have the, the crisp, you know, exile meaning that people have given to it. Um, so uh, texts of this era, you have to know the classical Greek. You also do have to know the modern Greek and every author is in a slightly different spot. Um, and it's tricky asking a bunch of people. I hope that, that answers. It's hard to, to say much more than that. Um, you know, the, and of course I can say, I can spot the flaws in the translation where I can see they've added things in the translation to make the story make sense. And in all of those cases, they're explaining difficult passages with reference to the story of her attempted coup, right? But I haven't read, you know, if, if there are problems in the description of the actual battles, um, or, you know, there's a lot of it that's sort of you know, tromping around, army went here, army went there, kind of like, you know, Xenophon type stuff. I, I haven't read those sections closely enough to know if there's any differences in the Greek, and I wouldn't expect it, because that Greek is so much more standard, right? If it's, you know, it's not so tricky. I think we'll finish with, with Holly's question, which is a, a, a sort of like it's a more practical uh, question here. Um, based on your discussion of women's roles in this period, I'm a, I am assuming that had Anna's brother not been born, she mm -hmm. still would not have been given any direct power, but her husband would have instead. How do these accusing of her of being power hungry uh, deal with this? Yeah, I mean, that, that's just a great question because, you know, had Nikki Forrest uh, taken power, she still wouldn't have had any, she still, she would have been empress, right? So there's a, sort of a sense in which it goes back and forth between her wanting to be, um, just wanting to rule because she's so arrogant, right? So she would, she would have been happy if she had been empress. Um, but there isn't any sense in which she would have had any more direct power over anything as the, the emperor's wife than as the emperor's sister. Um, and I think she probably had, she was an, an active person who did things. She didn't just weave her whole life. Um, but I, the description we have of her life is that she spent an awful lot of time reading philosophy and talking to philosophers and talking to writers. And it doesn't seem from that long description in her funeral oration that she would have spent any time sitting in the throne trying to like be royal um, or go and campaign and things. So um, her ideal womanhood, um, you're much more, being a good daughter is a lot more important than being a good wife. I think in this culture, there's more concern about good daughterhood. Um, and you're never allowed to talk about your own children. Um, to talk about your children is to boast of them, which is to risk having them get smote down by the yellow. And that's you know, both in ancient and medieval culture. You don't say anything good about your children, which of course people use to say um, she was a horrible mother. She never mentions her own children. You know, she's obsessed with power and she doesn't talk about her babies. Um, but of course, there's, you can't find anybody in this period talking about their own children. Uh, you only talk about uh, until until the parents have died, and then you can talk about how the, the children are statues of the mother. I think. Um, but. Okay, I think it just remains uh, for me to thank you once again, um, uh, Leonora, for absolutely wonderful talk. We're getting thumbs up there. Um, thank you. I, I know there's no sort of like sound here. But <laughs> Um, I appreciate it. It was lovely to talk with you all. Please send other questions if you have them. And I'm always happy to talk about Anna. And I really appreciate your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Good to see you.